The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism. William Grenville Davis was an uncommon leader, an Ontario Premier with vision, guts, and Main Street appeal. He died Sunday morning at age 92, having lived longer than any other Premier of Ontario ever. Tonight, we reflect on Bill Davis, the man and his legacy. Well, this is a discussion that I think all of our guests wish we were not having. They all worked for Bill Davis when he was Ontario's 18th Premier, and it is not an exaggeration to say they all loved him. And with that, we welcome in Wellington, Ontario, John Tory, Toronto's 65th Mayor. In Leeds County, in Eastern Ontario, Hugh Siegel, Senior Fellow in the Queen's University School of Policy Studies. And in Ajax, Ontario, Janet Ecker former Ontario finance minister. First of all, right off the top, condolences to you three. I know how much you knew and loved him. Um, but I'm guessing that a lot of people who are watching this right now are younger or new Canadians. Mr. Davis has been out of public life for three and a half decades. So I want to take just a moment off the top here to tell our viewers a bit about a man that some of them may not know. For example, let's bring this graphic up. He won four straight general elections, becoming the second longest serving premier in Ontario, served from 1971 to 85. He was never defeated in an election, seven straight wins in Brampton, and of course, four straight general elections. He was part of the group of first ministers who repatriated the constitution with an accompanying charter of rights and freedoms. That was in 1981. He formed North America's first ever ministry of the environment in 1971. He appointed the first ever female cabinet minister in Ontario history in 1972. That was Margaret Birch from Scarborough. If you're a tenant, you can thank him. He established Rent Review in 1975. He halted the construction of the Spadina Expressway in 1971. He greenlit the building of the Sky Dome, now the Rogers Centre in the mid-1980s. And as Education Minister in the 1960s, he created the College of Applied Arts and Technology System. He approved the construction of new universities, for example, York, Trent and Brock. And thanks to him, we are talking right now on a channel called TVO. Yes, he created TVO as education minister. I want to just start with all three of you by uh, trying to understand how you all got into Bill Davis's universe. And by that, I mean, Mayor Tory, how was it that you got to be his principal secretary in the early 1980s? It's like it was with so many other people, Steve, uh, whether it was millions of people that he served, whether it was thousands of people who belonged to the Progressive Conservative Party. I was a 15-year-old uh, who belonged to the young Progressive Conservatives, and he took an interest. I remember writing him a letter when I think I was 16, and he replied to the letter. And it was a Dear John, and you know, he could tell he hand-signed it. I'm not sure those days stayed forever. But you know, he took a personal interest, and so I just got to know him better and better. Because I got involved so young, I had the chance to be involved with uh, Hugh and uh, a number of the election campaigns. and. You know, lo and behold, I guess at a point in time, uh, you know, in 1981, he said, would I come and work in his office? But it was one of those things where because he took an interest in every person he ever met, every person he served, every person he knew in the party, um, and he had that same warm, decent uh, way about him. He was shy, but he still, you know, took an interest in people. And I think that was one of his uh, most redeeming qualities beyond all the accomplishments you listed earlier. Hugh Siegel, how did you enter his orbit? Well, it was actually by accident. Um, Alan Rock and I had just been elected to the student government at the University of Ottawa. Alan was president, and I was vice president. And um, the Ontario Union of Students had been a group that sent delegates to be on the Ontario Student Awards Advisory Committee, advising the Ministry of Colleges and Universities on student loans and all of that. But the Ontario um, Union of Students withdrew uh, as a matter of protest over something. But we withdrew at Ottawa U from the Ontario Union of Students because we thought they were spending their time and money on a whole bunch of interesting left-wing issues, uh, but not really on students and what university students needed. So the only students left who could be asked to go on to that advisory board were us at Ottawa U. And uh, the Deputy Minister, Ed Stewart, called Alan Rock, the president. Alan was a federal liberal and said, well, I don't really want to go to Toronto for that stuff. You should do it. You're the VP academic. And that, I went to Ottawa and sat at meetings at the Lord Simcoe Hotel. And what do you know? The Minister of Colleges and Universities would come for lunch and meet us all and talk about student financial assistance and the principle 
of universal access uh, without regard to money for all those who are qualified. And those are the days, just so we're clear, where they could serve steak at lunch and the minister could smoke a cigar without being up on charges. So quite a wonderful <laughs> match point. I became very, very impressed with him, actually. Uh, very good. Okay, Janet Ecker, how about you? Oh, it was another era, Steve. There's no doubt about it. Um, I had come down to work uh, from uh, uh, where I grew up in Exeter, uh, had come down to work for the Ontario government. I was actually working for the Minister of the Environment at the time, uh, handling media relations and speech writing and communications things. And and uh, they needed someone to replace. It was a great team, Sally Barnes and Vince Devitt. Um, when they stepped aside, um, I was one of the folks that was uh, asked to join the team and was incredibly, incredibly uh, happy and impressed and scared to death, I have to tell you, um, to join the gang because they, uh, it was a bit legendary. And I mean, to be working with even uh, Mayor Tory and Hugh Siegel at the time, they were sort of the uh, um, great stars of the party and the government. So it was very intimidating, but I enjoyed it and uh, never had a day where I regretted my choice. Mayor Tory, I know you could all give a very long list about what you liked about working for the men, uh, but I want you to see if you can nail it down to one thing. What was the one thing about working for him that made it so special? His feet always stayed on the ground. You know, I've told the story many times because I think it's the best example that he would come in uh, to the office in the morning. And the star headline could be, you know, three inches tall saying, you know, Davis accused of slacking off and wasting money. And he would totally ignore the front page of the paper and flip to the sports section and see how the Jays or the Argos or the Leafs or any sports team had done. And I think it was just a measure of his balance and his decency. I mean, he, he was the best boss I ever had. And, and, and I don't say that out of disrespect for anybody else because I never really saw him raise his voice or get angry or swear. The aforementioned Edward Stewart uh, and us, we all made up for the swearing when it was necessary, but he didn't. He just stayed calm and decent, uh, but uh, you know, he kept his feet on the ground. And I think that idea of the newspaper is a good example of that. No matter how big the issue, no matter how big the crisis, we're all running around sometimes had a bit of a flap, he was calm. And he was decent and he was polite and he was, uh, you know, just he was just a wonderful, wonderful person to work with and to know. Hugh Siegel, did you ever see him lose his temper or swear? No, um, quite the contrary. When other people were losing their temper and swearing, he would um, he would urge us all to get a grip. Um, I remember a great, a great story of having to go to a plowing match with him. I was on his staff and I knew very little about plowing. As you can imagine, I was born on pavement. Um, we went to the plowing match, and um, and he did all the things that you do, and he spent time taking pictures with the kids in 4-H and getting on the plow and doing all the rest. And and as we're, as we're getting into the car to go back to the airport to catch the plane back to Queen's Park, he said, uh, you know, Huey, there's a lot more wisdom out there with those farmers on the plowing match than there is in all the towers on Bay Street. And it's something I never forgot. And that reminded me that he was rooted in the rural decency and communitarian view of life that was part of Peel County, the rural Peel County into which he got elected in 1959, which of course changed dramatically to a huge multicultural city. But that always reminded me who he was at core. And I always felt very comfortable with that and honored to be part of it. Janet Ecker, your job in part was to write speeches for him. And I wonder if he ever delivered a speech the way you wrote it. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Never. <laughs> Actually, Same uh, here. What was, yeah, yeah. And a lot of us contributed on the speech writing. And some days you kind of wondered why we bothered. But one of the things that used to be so much fun um, was the media and the press gallery would say, we want to have a you know, a press conference with him. We want to ask him about this or that or whatever. Um, and so we'd set it up and he'd sit there and he'd just literally play with them, I guess is the only way to describe it. And he had such an interesting way of talking. Um, I think he'd start a sentence at the beginning of the press conference and he'd still be in the first paragraph at the end of the press conference. And I can remember reporters going over their notes in great detail because they thought he'd said something that they could quote. And then when they actually, you know, played the tape or looked at it, they couldn't use it. And I've never seen such a wonderful, wonderful ability to stand there, answer every question and never answer and get into any trouble. It was amazing. <laughs> Hugh Siegel, did you ever call him Bill? Well, I tried once and I learned my lesson and I never did it again. <laughs> we were having lunch 
with Donna, uh, my wife, and Kathleen, the wonderful Kathleen, uh, after the 1977 general election. And at the table, I figured I was going to give this a try. We'd just been on a campaign together in a bus and plane, spending day and night. And I said, uh, Bill, would you pass the salt? Silence. Nothing happened. No salt moved. <laughs> Kathleen said, oh, for God's sake, Billy. And I said, Premier, could I have the salt? The salt came right across the table. So I, I, I learned my lesson very clearly at that moment. But you know what? He was right. Calling him Premier was always the right thing. Janet Ecker, how about you? I'm guessing you never called him Bill once. Uh, no, no, I uh, never did and never dared to. And Premier just seemed to fit uh, whenever he was there. Even years I served on a corporate board with him after I left politics. And, and we all still, the directors sitting around the table, we all still called him Premier because it just was the right thing to do. I know that uh, perhaps the thing he is proudest of most was his contribution to the repatriation of the Constitution with the Charter of Rights and Freedoms as well back in the early 1980s. And Hugh Siegel, you were with him there in Ottawa during those negotiations. I wonder if you could tell us, again, for, for perhaps for younger viewers who were not alive at the time, what did he bring to the table at those negotiations? Well, first of all, uh, he and Richard Hatfield, who was the progressive conservative premier of New Brunswick, were the only two premiers of the 10 who were supporting the prime minister on the repatriation and the Charter of Rights and Freedoms. And at one point, the negotiations came apart because uh, Mr. Trudeau has suggested perhaps we can have a referendum on the matter. And um, a lot of the premiers did not want a referendum on the matter. And so the discussions were about to come to an end where Premier Law, he then said to his credit, well, if we're going to announce failure, we don't have to rush to do that. Why don't we spend the day working amongst each other to see if there's a middle ground? We can always announce failure tomorrow. And during that day, so there are a lot of discussions back and forth uh, between the group of eight and between the, the two premiers who are on side and the feds. And in the end, uh, the proposal uh, from a very distinguished lawyer who just passed away for the notwithstanding clause as a way to ensure that the provinces had the primacy jurisdictionally in their own area, but there was a charter that had constitutional standing was suggested. And Prime Minister Trudeau did not like that idea. And he, I think, was more than prepared to break down the conversation and head off to London himself to make the case for repatriation without any provincial support. And it was a phone call that took place and was then called the Carlton Towers Hotel. Now I think it's the Sheraton, where Mr. Davis um, and Mr. Trudeau spoke. And Mr. Davis was very clear. He said, you know, uh, the country was built through compromise, Pierre. Compromise is not a dirty word. And if you're not prepared to accept the compromise, I will not be going to London with you in support of patriation. And that produced a pause. And uh, then the prime minister said, well, let me look it over. And then we got a call uh, early, early in the morning uh, from uh, Michael Kirby, who was the associate secretary of cabinet for Fed Prague in, in uh, Ottawa, as I was in Ontario, and said, um, I think we have a deal. And it was Bill Davis who knew how to support something for a long period of time when he was the only one with Hatfield doing it. And then he knew how to say, you know what, turning your back on compromise is not in the Canadian way. And, uh, and without that, I don't think we would have had repatriation or the Charter of Rights and Freedoms, which has been used now to protect so many people's rights in so many circumstances and is really part of the heritage of this First Minister. Mayor Torrey, I'm really interested in his relationship with Pierre Trudeau because even though they worked very well together, and Hugh Siegel just gave a great example of that, they had nothing in common other than a love of Canada. I mean, one English, one French, one Ontario, one Quebec, one a folksy suburbanite, one an urbane intellectual. What was the secret to their getting on so well? I just think it was the way Bill Davis was. I mean, he could get along with anybody. And when I say that, uh, and, and the people I'm about to mention, in addition to Pierre Trudeau, it's not meant to in any way put any of them down. But he got along well with the labor leaders in the province. And, you know, I've, I've told the story, and he knows it, Janet knows it. And they would stand on the front steps of the legislature and criticize him and say he was the worst premier ever, and then come into his office and they could sit and do business with him. And after he left office, he would see those people as people who were his partners and colleagues and doing things. Same with, you know, Bob Ray, same with, uh, you know, a number of the people in opposite parties. He helped all the premiers who wanted his help 
after he left office. And he did that regardless of their party stripe. And so I think that allowed him to to get along and he found some things. I mean, he he told the story with great relish about how he had to help Pierre Trudeau learn how to kick a football uh, for uh, a great cup game, the first great cup game, I guess, where Pierre Trudeau was asked to, to uh, kick the football. And I think he found little ways like that to, and, and he was a master at looking at someone's resume and finding on the resume, if he was just about to meet them, that one thing that he had in common with them where he could kibitz with them and put them at ease. And then, you know, immediately the relationship was established. So I think uh, while he and Mr. Trudeau were very different people and he, he saw that firsthand and so did I, maybe Janet as well. I mean, he just found ways to get along and he knew it was his job too. I mean, he knew it was his job to get things done, uh, including the Charter of Rights and many other things. And he would he would give these speeches that I don't think were really from his heart where he would dump on them. But he had to do it as a matter of partisanship during elections or other times. So throne speeches that were written that he took great relish in repeating that criticized the federal government. But he knew you had to have them as your partner to get things done. And he did uh, form that partnership. Janet, uh, we've talked about this on the program so much in the past that we seem to be in an era of, um, well, let's just call it the politics of personal destruction. And that was not him. He looked across the floor and he saw opponents, not enemies. Where do you think that approach came from? Well, I think it came from his upbringing. I think it came from uh, who he was as a person. I mean, he just was a decent person. I think the thing to remember, though, is that he wasn't a pussycat. He wasn't a pushover. Um, he could be very, very competitive when he wanted to be um, and could be actually, I'll use the word, a little bit ruthless sometimes when that was called for. But what um, uh, he never, ever, I think, looked at the people across the way as the enemy. Um, and he always had a way of, um, even when he was giving you heck, and I was at uh, one of the corporate boards we were on together, um, there was a reason to have a government official in who would screwed up something for the company. And I remember watching um, the premier um, give this uh, gentleman uh, a dressing down in the nicest way. Um, the guy ate it up. I mean, he'd just been given what for in front of a whole bunch of other people, and he walked out with a smile on his face, message delivered, but it was just done in such a wonderful, uh, humane way that uh, you could work with him. He could do things with you. And, and I always remember, too, it sounds like a small point, but um, every time I staffed an event with him, though, at the end of it, he'd always just sort of look at me and say, thank you, Janet. And off he'd go on the rest of his day. And I never had uh, uh, a boss, and again, with all due respect to many good bosses I've had over the years, who was ever that courteous, actually, all the time. And that really made it it's a little thing, but it made an incredible impression on me because even in the midst of some crisis, even though he was the Premier of Ontario, he was still a human being, and that was really important to him. Hugh Siegel, I want to take you back to early 1983. Joe Clark steps down as leader of the Federal Conservative Party. There's a leadership convention, and you are, of course, uh, one of a number of advisors who are sitting down with Bill Davis and thinking really hard about whether he should run for the National PC Party leadership. Ultimately, he did not. Do you think he made the right decision? Um, that's a very good question. I think he made the right decision for himself um, and for his family. And I think he made the right decision in terms of the kind of life he wanted to have after uh, public service as Premier of Ontario. Um, I still think uh, he was the best prime minister we never had. I still think Canada would have done remarkably better had he become prime minister. And, and, and what is really interesting, of course, which shows you the kind of person Mr. Davis was, nobody campaigned harder uh, after he was elected leader for Brian Mulroney in Ontario than Bill Davis. Uh, there's this wonderful story of the press boss during that national campaign pulling up to 61 Main Street. Um, and there is Bill Davis, Premier, et cetera, all those good things. And he's on his ride a motor, motor mower, doing the lawn all by himself. And you know, the national press could not imagine this happening with any other first minister. But, that was kind of who Bill Davis was. So I think the country would have done really well with him as prime minister. But I think on balance, um, he made the right decision for himself, which after that many years in public service, he certainly had the right to do. But I was one of those who wanted him to do it. There were others who were opposed for a whole bunch of reasons, also what they thought to be in his best interest. And, you know, sometimes you lose a battle, but um, the uh, person you're trying to influence wins the war. 
John Tory, do you wish he had gone for that job? No, I, I, well, I mean, for the reasons Hugh said, he would have been a wonderful prime minister for Canada. But uh, he told me, uh, as I'm sure he did the others uh, here today, uh, that he didn't know if he ran for re-election in Ontario in, in a year later, whether he could have served out a full term just in the sense that he thought the time had come, as you said, to have a different life and to have another life, because he had a whole other career. I mean, a, a very fulfilling and rewarding and, and contributing one after he left public life. In many respects, he did the acid rain treaty. People forget that. And it was a huge accomplishment for all of Canada. And he served on a number of boards and helped a number of community organizations. But he just said, you know, maybe that the tank didn't have a full tank of gas for a full four year term. And so I just wonder if, you know, when you run to be prime minister, you've got to commit yourself effectively for eight years. Uh, you know, and, and I think that he maybe sort of thought about that very carefully and, and just decided that he could contribute in other ways, which he did right away after he retired as premier. He did the acid rain. A treaty. So you want to talk about something that was in the national interest. Uh, there is a really great example. And he applied himself to it the same way. I mean, he got to know the guy who was Re Ronald Reagan's appointee. And Ronald Reagan, I think it said, it was caused by trees or by squirrels or something. And he just applied himself to making that guy and his colleague and his partner and his friend and got something huge done for our country that most people probably would have said would never happen. Well, Janet, let me pick up the story there, because uh, you were part of the communications team the day after Thanksgiving in 1984, when he showed up at Queen's Park. And I remember being there, convinced he was going to call an election, and instead he retired. Your job was to write the speech that he was going to give in the media studio after he, meet, after he met with his uh, cabinet. What did you know about what he intended to do that day? I don't think any of us knew. Um, and I don't know, maybe John or Hugh uh, can share a great secret today, but I don't think they knew either. Um, the only inkling I had had um, that maybe he was going to leave was when I had staffed uh, a number of media interviews. It was around one of his anniversaries as premier. And what I noticed at the time was he spent a lot of time with the reporters talking about what he'd done. There wasn't a lot of talking about what he wanted to do still, where he wanted to go. And I can remember going home uh, uh, to uh, meeting my parents that weekend. I remember making a comment about, you know, I wonder how long my job is going to last because I think he may be thinking of leaving. And it was just the way he did that interview. But I got to tell you, none of us knew uh, what was going to happen. And uh, one of the, the newspaper networks across the country at the time, uh, when we used to have network chains across their newspaper chains across the country, had a deadline about an hour before the premier was actually going to speak. And the reporter called me and he said, he said, Janet, he said, like, I've got to make a call. Is he going to go? Is he going to stay? He said, tell me. And I was like, I have no idea. And he said, well, he said, I'll go with your gut feel. What's he going to do? And I remember saying at the time, um, my bet is he's going to uh, leave. He's going to resign. He's not going to run again. And the guy said, OK, fine, great. So they, they plated their front page of their papers. Davis resigns. And I've got to tell you, I'm standing there in the media studio while the premier's starting to talk, and part of me is going, oh, my God, he has to quit. I'll get fired if he doesn't. Um, <laughs> but uh, I've always remembered that day. The reporter called me up afterwards to say thank you very much. And I was like, oh, my gosh. Um, it, was, it was an emotional moment, though, because none of us wanted him to go. And there is no doubt in any of our minds, I think, that he could have had, if he'd had the heart to do it, could have been another, uh, another successful term. Uh, with the premier in Ontario. And in this day and age of politics, I don't know whether he would have been able to survive in the current, uh, you know, sort of dynamic, uh, the nest, as you said, the politics of destruction. I don't know. But I'll got to tell you, we could do, you could, we could use a little more Bill Davis these days in our federal and provincial politics. Well, I think we should hear from him. We brought him into the William G. Davis studio at TDO in 2009 to observe the 50th anniversary of his first election. And here's a little snippet from that. Sheldon, if you would. You're going to be 80 years old next month. More yesterdays than tomorrow's. Do you think much about your mortality at this stage of the game? Listen, I have 12 grandchildren. They keep you from thinking too much about your mortality. Uh, no, and I, you know, you go back to your other question. I don't know how long I will continue to, uh, to be here. Uh, all I know is I've been involved in every single election, federal and provincial, since I retired. I am interested in what's happening in Ottawa at the moment. I'm interested in what's happening at Queen's Park. Uh, I hope I continue. How long I continue uh, is not totally in my hands, uh, Steve. But I don't worry about 
what the historians will say, because I'm being very modest, but I am not uncomfortable with what we accomplished in the 25 years in public life. I'm not uncomfortable with the accomplishments. That's so Bill Davis. Um, Mayor Tory, I'm going to give you the last word here. When I wrote the biography on Mr. Davis several years ago, you told me for that book how much you were dreading the day when you couldn't pick up the phone and have him at the other end to take your call. And that day is now here. How are you doing? I think for all three of us, he, he was he was not just the premier and not just a boss, in my case, a law colleague. He was a he was an incredible friend and a mentor. And and you always knew you, you could call him, you know, in politics, you have difficult days. And, you know, once my dad was gone and even when my dad was here, uh, the person that I would pick up the phone and call if I was having a bad day in politics or just in, in anywhere would be Mr. Davis, the premier. And so um, all you can hope is you, you, that you have that ability, as you do with people who leave us, uh, to think of what they would have said and to think of the encouragement that you, uh, that you would get from them. Because it was always encouraging, it was always encouraging, yeah, as he was in his own life. You know, I mean, when he came in and those bad days were going on and he flipped to the sports section, that's because he knew that uh, this would pass. And uh, so I, it feels bad not to be able to pick up the phone and call him. Um, I was so glad that I had that conversation, I, as I think Huey did on his birthday uh, on July 30th, because uh, that lives with you forever, just because uh, many conversations were wonderful with him, all of them. But that one was uh, special because you knew that, um, you know, he wasn't too far. So we'll miss him. But, you know, he's got many reminders around all of us of everything he did. Every kid who goes to college or university, uh, you know, they may not know Bill Davis's name, but they will. he will be in their lives and every opportunity that presents for people right around Ontario. Mayor John Tory, Janet Ecker, Hugh Siegel, we're so grateful for this walk down memory lane. Thanks so much, you three. Thank you. And that's it for the agenda in the summer. We urge you to stay tuned to TVO because coming up next, we're going to present a fantastic behind the scenes look at the Davis government. It's a documentary called The Art of the Possible by filmmaker Peter Raymont, and it is a classic. You won't want to miss it. Tomorrow, we revisit our conversation with the first woman to lead Australia, Julia Gillard, on standing up to opposition politicians and on her historic so-called misogyny speech. I'm Steve Pakin. Thanks for watching TVO, for joining us online at tvo.org, and Nam Kiwanuka. We'll see you here tomorrow. The Agenda in the Summer with Nam Kiwanuka is made possible through generous philanthropic contributions from viewers like you. Thank you for supporting TVO's journalism.